Chapter 8. My friends are so emotionally fragile thanks to the economy. He was just a crazy person, Dixie. Chili Sue was studying her best friend's facial expressions with concern. This kind of whacked encounter was the last thing Dixie needed if he was to keep his sanity. They happened to be at the Spoil Sport that afternoon, sitting in a booth and waiting for Guff and Stacy and another friend named Pete Elmy, once again skipping class and getting smoothies. Well, I don't know, Dixie started back after a while. You know, Chili insisted, don't feed into people like that. Well, isn't there something to be said? He fumbled for words, cautiously, before he finally responded. I mean, after a while about ignoring nutjobs like that, you know, and until it's too late, Chili winced. Don't, don't, don't say that. That's stupid. Well, isn't there something to be said about ignoring? Dixie insisted. Maybe the reason everything goes to shit is because everybody just is so self... Look, nobody takes... There's no time, Chili interrupted. If you had to listen to every nutjob or doomsday sayer, I mean, you always like this stuff. That's the danger right now. Well, how are we any different, Dixie reasoned. Besides, I don't understand you. You keep saying yourself something doesn't sit right. Yeah, but what you're starting to dwell on is so outlandish, Chili explained. It's not your place to have to even talk to a person like that and explain. Well then, so who talks to him then? Who takes the time to shepherd him from going nuts in this crazy world? Who helps him out? Dixie demanded. I don't know. A psych... But she stopped herself short. You were going to say psychologist, weren't you? Dixie replied. See? I think this is why nothing ever changes. Nobody actually talks about uncomfortable stuff. At least reason thing... You know, trying to reason things out. No. Nobody likes confrontation. Chili admitted. Why would they want to? I don't know, because spook stories? Dixie replied matter-of-factly. How do you explain them? Chili threw her hands up in the air. Let me see that note. I actually did it this time. I wrote careful notes down, Dixie told her with pride as she examined the note. As she browsed it, her eyes raised with curiosity. Dixie could see them raising behind the note. Soon Guffin and his friends showed up, and without really saying hello, plopped themselves inside Dixie and Chili's booth and started doing their own thing. While Pete read a copy of The Sturden Sun and Guffin and Stacy zoned out on their phones, Chili repeated the words on the note, wondering why strange things kept happening to Dixie lately. Some of what she was reading was very unsettling. Information overload will give you power like the Watchers, she read out loud. And then... It's all connected, followed by friend, which happened to be crossed out, and then all-seeing, all-knowing information gives you power on the street to see everything like watchers. She looked up at Dixie and shuddered with disbelief. What the hell does that mean, she asked him. Dixie just shrugged and smiled. It sounds deep, but it was just some crazy wino vagabond he finally seemed to be convincing himself. Chili continued to read the rest of the note. Technology mimics the ability of watchers, but they knew that you wouldn't be able to handle it. Not back then, not even now. They gave you the gift, knowing that you can't handle power. Chili didn't like this, but Dixie had to smile. I mean, it is entertaining, he admitted. There's more, look. That was the bigger gibberish. Chili asked Dixie to tell her about the conversation with the wino vagabond once again in greater detail. After a while, Guffin looked up. What are you guys talking about? He asked, half interested. All I remember was the vagabond dude saying he discovered this deep stuff, yeah, this stuff deep below the earth or something, and then talking a lot about the origins of the world or something nuts, Dixie went on without explaining anything to Guffin. Chili put down the note and looked at their other friends. Half embarrassed how excited Dixie was getting about this, Guffin realized it was probably irrelevant and went back to reading. The rest of what he said was really surreal, though, Dixie continued to Chili. Actually, it kind of wigged me out. Chili scoffed somewhat darkly, but Pete interrupted her and ruined her train of thought. Look at this. Unsatisfied and unsatisfactory. That's what they think of us, Pete suddenly cried out rather unexpectedly. Look, 
He handed Dixie the newspaper article, and Dixie chuckled darkly at the headlines. All the while, trying to fight the slight pang of disappointment showing on his face. Huh, Dixie grunted after a bit, for he forgot his train of thought. Typical modern world. But after skimming the first paragraph of the article, Dixie couldn't help reading more and more. So that's what they think of us, huh? Reckless reprobates who are bored and boring, he said. It says here that in a national poll, we've been voted the most pathetic generation in modern times. Yeah, screw them. Polls are always rigged anyway, Stacy scoffed. I bet they say that about every generation. That's just according to the student son, Guffin agreed. But what the hell does that mean anyway? Dixie and Chili Sue skipped their afternoon classes to get smoothies. Some of their friends had done the same, and no one was pleased with the bad press. We're not all like that, protested Chili. Stacy muttered some unintelligible vulgarities as she read further down the article. Vapid and angsty, according to the Thermopylaeville Times. She looked up and wanted to toss a paper across the room. They ultimately said we suck at protests. What? What does that even mean? asked Guffin as he grabbed the paper. But then he read it himself. No one under 30 can organize an effective protest without becoming a laughing stock. As he read the article further, he put it down on the table with disgust. Just like their pathetic parents did probably. Who wrote this shit? But he kept reading. They use complaining about society as an excuse to actually face their own existential problems. What, did a therapist write this? What was the point of the census anyway? Nobody was pleased with this. See, this is why they take away reduced health care privileges to anyone under 30 who have a clean bill of health. Chili groaned back sarcastically. Yeah, that makes sense, because they claim we whine too much. Yeah, reasonable national policy amendments, said Pete, who was also sitting with them. I guess the stats don't lie, though, he continued. The influx of protesting goes on, and it's raising the taxes, security, and health care costs everywhere. Now, that's bullshit, Chili insisted again, with a fist hitting the table. That's just an excuse to jack up premiums. Besides, I've been to many credible protests. Remember the nukes? The automatons taken over? Yeah. But when th- those were different, though. Dixie pondered with some remorse. But then again, there were the robot love protests last summer, he continued. Yeah, that was pretty stupid, actually. Come to think of it, sometimes even he felt ashamed of his own generation. Hey, not all of us make an ass out of ourselves, one of them said. Yeah, but it's the clowns who always end up getting the biggest media coverage... People like being entertained, said Pete. Shit. Like robot love, protest, all that crap. It devalues the idea of protesting and justifies cities to jack up security costs. I just I just can't believe they took a poll on what people thought about anyone under 27, put, it, put in Stacy. I mean, who cares what we think? Apparently a lot of people, Dixie replied as he threw the newspaper up at the feet. You know, lately, I've been really making an effort to understand real-world problems, he confessed to his friends. Real world, asked Stacy. Yeah, you know, adult problems. The responsible kind, supposedly, that supposedly make you responsible. (laughs) It's about damn time, Guffin replied with a laugh. And I wish I hadn't, Dixie continued. Seeing how just because I know things, I still can't do a damn thing about things. He picked up the paper once again and looked at a paragraph near the middle of the article and pointed at it. It says right here they did this as some measure to see if free, reduced health care should still be available to anyone under 27. Ideally in their minds, apparently reduced health care age should be lowered to anyone under 18 again. Suddenly, a realization was starting to form in Dixie's head. Which means we're really going to have to cover our own health care out of our own pocket at this rate. Great, and I can barely afford college. Your parents pay for college, Chili corrected him. Shut up, that's not the point. My point is that things get more and more complicated for no stupid reason. How did higher education get unsocialized again? And yet the government went back to force health care again? I don't want to pay for health care. The conversation among the five of them moved on to debate how postmodern America woke they were about the things going on behind the scenes of society that the older generation seemed to conveniently ignore. After a futile debate on what really mattered in life, Guffin, Stacy, and Pete went off to play a game of nutmechug on their gyrotar phones outside.
Well, I'm sorry for the distraction, Chili Sue said to Dixie when they had left. Don't worry about it. It's not your fault. Before they continued, Chili had to ask for an update about the car. So what did your parents say about the car? Dixie shrugged. Actually, they agreed with me. How so? Dixie explained to Chili his conspiracy theory about the highway department in Cank Anchorville working with the mechanics shops all over the area. Chili had to smile. That's stupid, she said. Yeah, but there's just too many parts of the road missing in Kinkankerville, he told her. That's why all the mechanics are rich. Think about it. Well, then I wish I studied cars instead, Chili Sue half-joked, biting the straw of her smoothie. At least that would get my parents off my back. It's not too late, Dixie grinned. After a few moments, he shared a thought he had gotten out loud. Could we... Still skip all day and talk like this if we were working real jobs, he asked. And Dixie looked down at the table and then up at Chili. She shrugged and twirled her straw with her tongue. Dixie sighed. Chili laughed and, pursing her lips, blew the straw at Dixie. It hit his shoulder and he feigned like he was shot. Chili burst into laughter. Lighthearted and spaced out at the worst possible times, Dixie thought to himself. Maybe I shouldn't ask, Chili continued after a while. But it sounds like you were going to say something else about that guy. What guy? The vagabond, she insisted. The homeless guy at the bus stop. Well, who said he was homeless? You did. Oh, yeah, Dixie added. But then he remembered the exact words of the mysterious drifter. And Chili looked at him with confusion. Wait, can you repeat that? She asked, slightly unnerved. I think he said something else about how if you're not self-aware, you're not going to survive. Self-aware of what about what's about to happen, I think. Well, what on earth does that mean? I don't know, Dixie shrugged, somewhat perplexed. He added something about how there was something, I don't know, profound that was coming that he had discovered by traveling up north. Until he thought about it, then a revelation hit her, and it didn't feel comforting. He's clearly insane, Chili added with tight shoulders, and almost afraid to motion towards the north. I, I know, I know, Dixie said somewhat cryptically, and somewhat scared at the same time. He thinks he really believes he came from Inaka land. Yeah, I got that part, said Chili. She was perplexed. You have the worst timing for strange coincidences happening at the same time. It's amazing you haven't cracked. As he wiggled down in his chair, Dixie felt the lump pressing against his leg. He strengthened himself up, serious now, and pulled the book from his cargo pants pocket. <laughs> oh yeah, actually, what I really wanted to talk to you about is this. You had it here the whole time, cried Chili. What the hell was the point of the note? Just to show I take notes, he explained. He handed Esoteric Myths and Esoteric Places Volume 3 and Nakalan to Chili, and went back to talking about the strange encounter with the vagabond at the bus stop. It's a paperback, commented Chili Sue as she flipped through the pages. It looks more like a novel, not a textbook. I know. I know, I know. But it is a text, I think, replied Dixie. Actually, it's kind of cool, though. I mean, look. I wish I could get the other volumes. Leaning forward, though, and lowering his voice, Dixie told Chili about some of what he had read the night before. And though it wasn't really a secret, he felt it was important to keep the knowledge he now had safe. Chili scrutinized Dixie's face, searching for a reason for this infatuation, though. Look, maybe you really should go see a doctor, she confessed gently. I can't, he explained unhappily. It will probably take a week before I can confirm an appointment with my crappy insurance policy. Plus, I don't think I'm sick. At least I don't feel it. Dixie described how real his vision of the floating tower from the day before felt. He tried to remember every detail. Then carefully, he opened the book to page 233 and pointed the identical illustration. I didn't draw this, he explained to her. Are you sure? Maybe you spaced. You don't... You do know how attention deficit disorder works and affects your memory, right? No, Chili, this really happened. Check it out. There's scribble all over the book. It looks like someone ventured up through Inaka land, and it's obviously not my writing. He did look a little embarrassed. Well, maybe, maybe not him, maybe. Maybe, what, the vagabond? You believe all this, she asked? And she was admittedly scared, 
even though she did her best not to show her concern. Well, deep down, not really, he answered, although Chili smiled because she knew he was lying. They both really didn't need to go down this rabbit hole. Look, don't ruin the moment, Dixie continued. But some geek out there clearly looks like he did a lot of work to share his views about something. Forgive me, her views. She claims she's an archaeologist. There's a name written on the back of the book. Chili took the book and turned it over. She didn't know anyone named Tapanta Dobson. After Chili went on her phone to do a quick internet search herself, they were no closer. Just someone who had studied archaeology at the University of California long ago. That sort of could make sense, said Chili Sue. Somebody, maybe some new age hippie probably, studying archaeology trailing off into Anaka land. But she must have been rich. Or who would be crazy enough to fund an expedition like that? Well, you should read the descriptions in this thing for yourself, said Dixie. There's all twisted myths and urban legends about Inokaland, as you know, but it gives it a different spin. I tried to do a search online about Inokaland, and nothing really describes it like this book. Well, what else does it say? Chili had to ask. Well, from what I've read, Inokaland was popularly believed to be a secret testing ground for nuclear experiments, well, as you know, by the Army at one point. That's why the atmosphere up there is so toxic. What? Yes, I already knew that, Chili said after she set up another straw. No, I know, I've heard it too, Dixie replied. Stories about how research planes never go up there either. I can see how it's kind of risky. I mean, all those ionized clouds covering the landscape all the time. But it's explained here in more detail. Look, read this part. Chili insisted to have Dixie just simply quote what he was trying to come at. According to geophysicists, it says, look, read this. The heavy ionization in the atmosphere messed with any testing instruments and transmissions. This doesn't make it safe for traveling and communications. Dixie looked up. Well, maybe crazy people like this Tapanta woman ignored the warnings and went up there anyway. I mean, it's kind of brave if you think about it. You just said she's crazy. That's not brave, Chili corrected him. Nah, but maybe she's better off than the rest of us. I mean, <laughs> dude, life around here is so boring anyways. Chili could see Dixie had that infamous Zen blank stare on his face. He always did when feeling inspiration, and she knew what he was thinking. I mean, maybe it pays to be curious, he added. Yeah, maybe you want to believe going up there is really possible, Chili teased him. Well, maybe we have gaping gaps about reality that prevent us from putting it all together, Dixie insisted right back. It would be nice to at least think there's more. Otherwise, sooner or later, we'll become institutionalized and indifferent. Go insane. Dixie stared right past Chili's left ear, as if he was seeing something right behind her, and blinked several times. Then he shook his head, and blinked several more times as if he had just gotten hit by a giant pillow. What, an another vision? asked Chili. You need to see a doctor. I feel fine. I'm just... I don't know, it's like I'm dreaming or something. That's not natural, Chili insisted with concern. At least go see a therapist. I would not trust a therapist with my life, cried Dixie. Fix you up and then implant some crazy Agent Smith crap inside of you or something. You of all people should know that. And yet, Chili's painful reminder of the therapy session incident came pouring into her face and the look of pain on it couldn't hide her anxiety. Ugh, jeez, I'm sorry, Dixie quickly added. I am. I really am sorry about that. Look, all I'm saying is that maybe this person was a real truth seeker. Somebody actually with the ovarian fortitude to follow through. Maybe instead of following the boring daily grind, she wanted to find some answers about what the hell lay beyond Concankerville's north. Dixie grinned as he let it sink in for Chili. He was deluded, he knew it, but he was hoping Chili was going to be rational, or at least appreciate what he was trying to say, and rationalize some added credibility to all this and show at least a little bit of interest in getting sidetracked with this excitement to their otherwise mundane existence. He thought it was exciting at any rate. 
and he sipped his smoothie, watching Chili flip through the pages. She paused briefly, and her eyes widened with curiosity after a bit, but she shook her head as if trying to clear it. No, Dixie, wake up. This is just a distraction from our algebra exam tomorrow. We should be in class. I'm starting to feel guilty for skipping. My parents are, are getting on me about it. If I fail, it's just going to reinforce how much of a slacker they think I am. I can't even think of anything else right now. Sorry. Dixie didn't know why he felt so bad, but at the moment, looking at his friend across the table, he reckoned it was time to put someone else's needs before his own. And even though he didn't feel an ounce of earnestness behind his next words, he did his best to summon up the sincerity. Let's just kick butt on the test, all right? He said to her. We'll solve everything else later. Look, don't worry so much. I'll see you tomorrow ready to destroy that thing. You'll see. Yeah. Yeah, sure, whatever. Chili gave a small smile and agreed. Look, I'm tired of having Professor Existy call me out in class and make me look stupid. Ah, sc screw him, Dixie snorted back. I think that's just any math professor, looking over the people who can't count. That guy likes to take out his frustrations on students, I swear. What does he know about anything anyway? Nothing. He's a math professor at a community college. Come on, how important can he be? Dixie was satisfied that he had sufficiently cheered up Chili Sue. She deserved to be happy. He felt better, at least, knowing she was calm. Let's just get out of here, he said to her. And he pulled Chili Sue to her feet. I've distracted you enough. Go study. Chili nodded, resigned. She grabbed her wallet and patted Dixie on the back. You too, she said, and left.